pray now as we come around your word, Lord, that you'll challenge, Lord, you'll provoke us, Lord, you'll speak to your congregation. Today, Lord, that we'll know, Lord, your word, we'll know it in our hearts, Lord, and that you'll have spoken to us. So bless us now, we pray, in your mighty name, Father. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible with you, could you turn with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 5? And we're going to continue with a, what it is that we're looking at together as a church. Which is what it is to rebuild. Rebuild from a ruin. Rebuild from when something has fallen apart. Rebuild from a position of weakness. Rebuild from a position where only the, uh, those with their hands held out are. And not the people with their sleeves rolled up. That's what we need to learn. How to rebuild from that position. And today we read... A very strange vision from Zechariah 5. It's one that we've been building up towards. And it's one of my favorite ones in the Bible because it's so bizarre. And I love the bizarre and the obscure and the things that we don't really kind of, and we look at it and go, I don't even know what that's about. So I don't think I'm going to touch it with a barge pole. But today, hopefully, we'll understand. We're going to look at the woman in a basket. Zechariah 5, 5 says, Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, What is it? He said, It is a basket that is going forth. He also said, This is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up, and there is a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, This is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with wind in the wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. And so I said to the angel who talked to me, Where are they carrying the basket? He said to me, To build a house for it in the land of Shinar. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. How bizarre. A basket with a woman in it with two other women with wings carrying the basket, it sounds like the beginning of a joke. But it isn't. Today we're looking at this, something that we have to remember that prophecy in the Bible is pictorial. The Lord speaks in pictures. He speaks in pictures to his people so that they understand the pictures. And the pictures are very important. When we look through the pictures, and understand them by what the rest of Scripture says, we can start to decode what they mean. And today we need to decode a particularly bizarre-looking image, but all the Scripture reveals to us exactly what is here. Zechariah is often considered a very difficult book to understand. Yet in reality, Scripture reveals Scripture to us. And today, I believe that we have a very important message that comes. But we have to remember what it is that Zechariah is doing when we come across the woman in the basket. There are many, many, many sermons you can come across on the internet, on YouTube, of people who have preached on the woman in the basket, and they've all got a very different interpretation of what they think it is. But they all take it out of isolation. No, in isolation. Oh, one of the two. They take it away and put it there, and here's a woman in a basket with two women that look like storks carrying it away, and this is what it means. But it isn't taken in isolation because it's part of a whole. It's a part of a series of prophecies, of visions that have been given to Zechariah. This is the seventh one of them. A series of visions that are given to Zechariah to give to the people who have returned from Babylon to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now that is a very physical thing that they needed to do. They've been away from Jerusalem for 70 years. The people that are coming back are not the people that went. They're the sons of, they're the ones who heard the stories of. And it's only a small minority of all those who were carried away. Everybody was invited to come back and rebuild, but only a small percentage did. And they came back to do the thing that God wanted them to do, to rebuild the temple, the most important thing. Because without that temple, it is impossible to praise God. The sacrificial system that is in the Old Testament, which might seem barbaric to us, is an example to teach us every single day that without God at the center of your life, your life has no meaning. 
Not only does it have no meaning, you will struggle and battle like the worm who cannot see every day to try and find where it is that you need to go. Therefore, the first thing they built was the altar of God. Until we can be a thankful people, a people of worship, a people who are grateful for the little that we have, why would God give us the most? And we know that to be true. How many times we see on TV or we see in supermarkets or we see maybe even in our own families children who are exceptionally ungrateful for vast quantities of goods that they have purchased at birthdays and at Christmases and sometimes for no real reason at all and they expect it instead of being grateful for it. And yet some of you may have grown up at a time where literally all you got for Christmas was a dog and a drum and a kick up the bum. As my dad used to say that, we were getting every year. We need to be a grateful people. Yet, even though they were doing God's work, they'd stopped. They'd stopped because there was persecution. They'd stopped because... People had come and said they couldn't. They'd stopped because they'd physically been stopped from doing the thing that God had called them to do. And to that end, the Lord sent two prophets, and Zechariah was one of them, to encourage them to get back on with the task that they were called to do. And that's what the Lord wants to do. I was asked very wisely and intelligently a question that is often asked. Is Christianity done in this country? We've been asked it several times. We, some of you might remember when we were sat in a Bible study and a young man came in at the end of the Bible study and sat down and said, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in the Bible study. I've just got one question. Is the church finished? Is there any relevance anymore to Christianity in this country? And you know the answer to that question is, reality is Christianity has no relevance to this country. For all of the users still holding on to the idea that we're a Christian country, which is nonsense, and it's always been nonsense. It isn't relevant to society because society wants to go its own way. And when we try and be relevant to society, we miss the purpose of the gospel, which is to pull people away from society and into the kingdom that we are called to. It isn't relevant to society. And the more society finds its own feet away from God, the more that it thinks it can do what it wants to do, it ends up like the time just before Noah, where everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Well, I've got away with this and nothing's happened. Now I'm going to get, oh, nothing's happened. And nothing's happened. And still nothing's happening. Maybe I can get away with anything that I want. And not realizing that the Lord just adds it all up. Tolerance isn't what we're called to. Perseverance. It tells us in Second Peter that the Lord is patient, slow to anger, hoping that all might come to repentance and that none should perish. That is the will of God. He sent his son to die that none should perish, but that all may have eternal life. And when those who die, who have refused to acknowledge Christ as Savior, his words are, are just like David's. When David's own son, who corrupted and tried to steal the kingdom from him, he says, oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, if only I could have died in your place. And that is the heart of God. should be our heart too as well for one another. And to that group of people, Zechariah is prophesying, a message of encouragement. And to that message of encouragement, you get a picture of a woman in a basket. Do you feel encouraged this morning? It's kind of like something you get at Ikea, really. They'd been stopped because of opposition, persecution, and depression. So how does hearing about a woman in a basket help? Well, what is it that they're there to do? They're there to build. And if we look at the last verse here of Zechariah, we read that there is some else building. What is the woman in the basket doing? Where is she going? 
Well, it tells us that something else is being built. At the same time as the people of God are supposed to be rebuilding Jerusalem, there is something else that's being built as well. A house for the woman in the basket in the plain of Shinar. Now, that might mean nothing at all to anybody here. But when we use Scripture to understand these things, they help to decode to us. It tells us this about the plain of Shinar so that we understand it in Genesis 11. Most of you probably know Genesis 11. It says this. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. What is going on here in Genesis 11? Well, it's after the flood. The generations of Noah working in unison together to build a city. That's great, because that's what we've been talking about in Zechariah, that all tribes, tongues, and nations as the church should be being brought together to build. But what are they building? Well, they're not building something to God. They're building quite the opposite. See, when you bake bricks, and when you then use tarmac, as is, for mortar, you're actually making something that's waterproof. They're making a plan. If God dares to flood this earth again, we'll be ready for him. We'll have a tower that we can run into and defend ourselves. We won't have him dictating to us how we must live, and therefore mankind will save itself from God. That is the Tower of Babel. That is the purpose of the Tower of Babel. That's what they're building. When the European Union built its, its uh, parliament building in Strasbourg, they built it on a picture of the Tower of Babel. They said that we are going to undo the work that God did at the Tower of Babel. Their nature is to bring together all tribes, tongues, and nations. But as we see, it doesn't work. Only God can bring together that which was separated. And God is doing that. In our church here, we can look around and see very much that we're all from very different places. I mean, I'm from Stoke. You can't get much more foreign than that. So there was a rolling of the eyes then. But we are a group of different tongues, of different tribes, of different cultures, yet the Lord has brought us together to build but here on the plain of Shinar, something has been built, and that building is wickedness. It stands against God. It stands against the process of who God is, and tells us is there that the Lord confused the language, man tribalized, and he split off. In Zechariah, this woman in this basket is called wickedness. The word for wickedness there in the Hebrew means somebody who is morally wicked, and somebody who is spiritually wicked. It is the full version of evil, really. It is the most evil word that there is, or word for evil. And therefore, this woman in the basket represents the wickedness and the evil that can be built and can be brought out. And we're with it so far. Evil lives in a basket, and the basket is having a house being built near where the Tower of Babel was built. Let me just explain at the moment. This is all still pictorial. I'm talking about something that's literally happening. That would be very strange. This is all pictorial so that we understand that process. This word for evil is a word that is also used about another woman in the Bible. Her name is Jezebel. Jezebel, the high priestess of Sidian, the one who was the high priestess of the worship of Baal. She also bears the same name. Now, that might not necessarily mean anything to you, except for if you translate the word Baal into English, 
it means Lord. If you translate the word Jehovah into English, the word is Lord. You've got two people with the same name. But one is truly God, and the other is a false God. And now we start to see the process of what Zechariah's vision is building up here. It's building up of those who worship God and those who worship one who pretends to be God. A false religion. A false teaching. That woman represents what we call Babylon in the Old Testament, in the, in the book of Revelation. It's the false church. It is the gold-dripping, saint-killing, martyr-drinking abomination. But even John when he saw it, went, wow, that's amazing. Because it looks the quill. It looks the part. It looks amazing. It's so exciting. It seems like it's got every good thing in it. But like the sirens of Greek legend, it will dash you on the rocks and destroy you. Don't go with her, my son, it says in Proverbs. For she will drag your feet down to Sheol. She will drag you away. And that is the truth of who this woman represents. You would think that such a one shouldn't be allowed to have a house built. God had already stopped them building something in Babylon, in Shinar. Why not stop them again? But Zechariah says that she's having a house built. Why is she having a house built? Why would the Lord allow for a house to be built? What is the point of this house being built? There are a lot of questions for us to throw at. And so that we might understand this morning that I'm not trying to give you a Bible study as to what this, although it is important that I explain what the verse means, but to give you the same note of encouragement that Zechariah was giving to the people who had stopped building so that we are not a people who stop building, but we are a people who pick up our trowels and get on with the work that God has called us to do, which is to build a spiritual Jerusalem. And those building blocks, those stones are you. And the works of you, you are the buildings of God. We make up the city of God. We are the bride of Christ. And that is something that we do individually for each other because together we are it as a whole. And we need to understand then the encouragement here to understand what it is that we're teaching. Why does it have to be built? Because there's a simple truth. And this may feel very black and white to you, but I'm afraid that it is true. And it must be true because Bob Dylan sung it. Those who are not for us are against us. Bob Dylan sung, you're going to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you are going to serve somebody. And that is the truth of it. For those who have ever seen the film The Matrix, it's the best way of explaining it. And those of you who have never seen the film Matrix, you will not understand what I'm about to say to you. But everybody is plugged into the system and the agents can be in any single one. You are all the enemy. Unless you are freed from it. That was a little Matrix reference. If you didn't get it, don't worry about it. I was like two kids at the back nodding, go, yeah, I remember the Matrix. I don't remember that scene though. Throughout the Bible, there's always a true spiritual. But the truth about the true spiritual is it's often imperfect. It makes mistakes. Sometimes it makes really bad decisions and does wrong things. And sometimes it has to be corrected and sometimes it has to be brought back. But that's the true spiritual. But then there's the false. And that's never good. It's never got anything good about it. And it can be caught out when you know. We see it all the way through. Ishmael and Isaac. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Israel and Samaria. Which is kind of the same thing. The church and Babylon. It's all throughout the scripture. It's not something just made up. The church has its good days. 
<laughs> it has lots of bad days too. But we are the mode in which the Lord is using to fulfill his plans and purposes here upon the earth. And that's important that we know. We will make mistakes. But God is still for us. But then there is one out there that is against us. And people get drawn and pulled into it. The reason that eventually this house has to be built on the plain of Shinar is because in the end, all of those things that have been building towards Babylon, it tells us in the book of Revelation, Babylon will fall. And all of those who were within it, all of those who were a part of it, they will be judged. They themselves will have made their decision. They have chosen that way instead of God's way. They have chosen for themselves instead of for the Lord. That there will be in the end an ultimate facing off. That's one of the reasons. And in that, they will be judged, not because they stood against God, because he would accept that all day week of the week, but because they touched the apple of his eye. They persecuted the people of God. As it says, when the fifth seal is emptied, uh, opened, and the martyrs cried from underneath the altar of God, how long, Lord, till you will avenge our blood? those who have killed and killed and killed and persecuted the works of God and the people of God, which is the thing that those of Zechariah at that time, they were coming against, those people who surrounded them, the Samaritans and the other nations who did not want them to build the things of God. They didn't want them to do it, and so they stood in their way. And in the same way of those who stand in our way for us to build the things that God wants of us each individually to build, there comes a day of reckoning in the end. And it isn't for us to get excited about the fact that, thank goodness, those people are going to be punished for what they've done against us. Because that isn't the Lord's heart. And it shouldn't be our heart. Because as I've already said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we've already seen in these visions, it is God's heart that those who are against him will become for him. At one time, we were all against him. We all stood against the Lord. We all said we were his enemy and the Lord still died for us. He still cared for us. He still saved us when we were yet his enemy. And now we can be accounted as part of the, those who love God. And that is his heart and desire for every single one of us. And that should be the case that we know that within ourselves that we don't hate those who hate us that we don't hate those who persecute us, that we don't hate those who mean us harm because we don't fight against flesh and blood. They are people who need to hear the gospel of grace. Our enemy, our enemy is a spiritual one and it is his desire to make you utter the words I don't believe that God is real anymore. He'll settle for, I believe somebody else's God is real. But that's his plan and purpose because none can be snatched out of the hand of God. They can only willingly walk away from them. And that is important that you know that. He is calling, ever calling, and yet he's a roaring lion with no bite. The power that you give to the enemy is the power that you give to the enemy. He has no other power against you because Jesus has defeated it all on the cross. We don't need to go in our past and start exercising three or four families ago because some of my generations once told a lie or once stole something or there's a murderer somewhere in there. It's craziness. It was all dealt with at the cross. Sin's curse broken, no longer having a hold on you, no longer having a hold on you. And that's what we understand. But it is important that we know that one day judgment will come so that it gives us a sense of urgency. How many people do you know who are close family, friends, people that you work with, 
that you know are going to end up in that, the wrong side of that judgment. And that's why that message of the gospel which we have should be strong. We should stop, friends, trying to cozy up to the woman in the basket. We should stop trying to get on side with the woman in the basket. We should stop trying to build bridges to the woman in the basket. She is wickedness. Babylon is not the church. But we should preach the gospel to those who are in it and say these words, Come out of her, my people. Come back and build the places of God and not the house in Shinar. Come and work again in the kingdom of heaven, not in the cities of Babylon. Don't end in the city of destruction. If you've accepted Christ Jesus as Savior, what do you have to do with them? Nothing. Walk away from them. We seem to be unable to say that in this day and age. I don't know why. Some of you were old enough to know that you can only go back 10, 20, 30 years. There would have been no compulsion or issue for anybody to stand here and say that those people who preach a different gospel are wrong. But now, through some form of correction, we seem to feel like we've got to accept everybody's view because ultimately they use the name of Jesus Christ. Well, the devil uses the name of Jesus Christ and I'm not willing to accept him as a partner in all things. We need to be clear about that and understand, come out of here, my people. So why then is Zechariah telling us about this other building? Why is he telling us about it? And the answer is because he is showing us where its workers come from. Where do the workers of that other building come from? They come from within. They come from within the camp. They come from our number. In the parables of the kingdom, in Matthew 13, Jesus' second parable, he says this. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. It's not the plants which are the people in this parable. It's the soil. Sometimes the seed doesn't take. We know that from the first parable. In fact, of the four kinds that are sowed, it doesn't always take. But when it does, we see sons of the kingdom growing out from inside of the heart of men are fruits worthy of repentance. And what this teaches us is something. There's not just Christ who is sowing seed. There's an enemy who is sowing seed as well, but his seed is not of the same fruit. It doesn't produce the same things in men. It doesn't produce fruit that is worthy of repentance. There's another who is sowing in the hearts of men. And today, as we are the arms and legs of the Lord, the body of Christ sent out to sow the good seed, the gospel, we need to know very clearly there's another who is sowing at the same time. Another who is chasing down As they say, if you want to get rid of a baby, you don't do it when he's 15 years old. You do it before they're born. Kill the child before it grows. That's the devil's tactic. Kill the baby before it's grown. Kill the baby before it's had a chance to maturity. Kill that child. Get rid of it before 
And we read of the birds of the air that come down and snatch the seed off the soil and take it away. In the physical, farmers even today will tell you that a majority of their crop will be stolen by such birds before it's even had a chance to grow. The more seed we sow, the more chance it has of hitting a target and growing. And that is a great promise, but it's also a great challenge. But what are the attributes of the sons? Well, Darnell or Tez produce completely different fruit. They grow identically, however. They look identical in their infancy. And as they develop, they change. One changes into the fruit of repentance. And the other changes into the fruits of selfishness. How might we know the difference between them? Because wheat produces 30, 60, and 100 fold of the same seed that was sowed to make it the gospel. But the Darnell produces its fruit from the seed that made it. It produces a corrupted gospel. And in that case, we can see who the Darnell are within us. Those who preach a different gospel. Paul tells us there are only two reasons that we should not fellowship with other people. One is, if they refuse to acknowledge that they need to grow in their relationship with the Lord. The other is if they produce or preach a different gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. No matter how good you are, you didn't stand up to God's standard. The law tells us that. Therefore, the law's job is to tell you you can't be saved. You can't go to heaven. You don't have a right to stand there and say, but I'm better than. You are better than. You're better than me. You're better than the person sitting next to you, most likely. But it isn't either of us that you have to be better than. You have to be better than God. And none of us are that. Therefore, the law does its job. Now we come to faith. Faith accepts that since we cannot save ourselves, we need another to save us. And the only one who is possible to save us is the Lord, and therefore we call upon his mercy. But God is just. It wouldn't be right for him to just turn around and say, right, well, I forgive you, because why can't he just do that for everybody? His law is meted out fairly. tells us several times in the Bible that the Lord hates unjust weights. has to be fairly balanced out. Therefore, the cost of the law, the cost of justice, the cost of sin, which is death, he willingly put upon his own son. This is the gospel. That if you accept Christ Jesus as your saviour, if you make him lord of your life, then your sins are forgiven. The past sins that you've committed, the sins that you are committing, the sins that you will commit, are all forgiven. They're all paid for. Therefore, from that moment on, you know that you have a place that is secured in heaven. And you believe that by faith. And it is the faith that pleases God. It is the faith in God that makes you righteous because it is God who makes you righteous. That is the gospel. Anybody who preaches a different one is Darnell. A gospel of works, the sacraments, it's Darnell. The gospel of the Mormons, it's Darnell. The gospel of the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's Darnell. The gospel of the Muslims, it's Darnell. The gospel of the prosperity preachers, it is Darnell. Only the gospel of grace is the fruit of the Lord, is the good seed, is the seed that we should know and the seed that we should preach. We see that although the Lord could sweep away all of those who were preaching that, and we might ask ourselves, why doesn't he do that? In fact, it's a frustration sometimes for many of us. Why are these people allowed to keep carrying on and keep dragging people away? And the answer is because God loves you. And God loves those people who are being dragged away because he wants them to come back. He wants to give them that opportunity 
he is slow in his anger so that all might come to repentance. That is the heart of God. And there will come a day. And that's why he's allowing them to build a house in Shinar at the same time as we're building one here in the kingdom of heaven. That's why. Because if he destroyed that, it may very well destroy you too. And so, the Lord allows it to carry on. He reserves that judgment to the end. That maybe, just maybe, that soil will accept the good seed of the gospel before it's all too late. Now, all of these organizations, all of those ones that I mentioned, they've all come out of the church. The Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Even Islam. They've all come in a way out of the church. They were all originally here. But what that parable of the Darnell tells us is that they were never part of us. They were in the camp, but they weren't of the camp. They were seed that was sown by the devil. They were there, but they weren't of us. None of it was ever the church. They aren't backslidden Christians. They never were Christians. They were just here. When we looked a couple of weeks ago at the verses preceding what we just read in Zechariah, we looked at the flying scroll, which is another bizarre image. A flying scroll that has curses on both sides. It tells us it goes here and it goes through. It is looking everywhere. And anybody who has fallen short of the glory of God, fallen short of the law, the curse will bring its retribution upon them. Because that is the truth of it. That is what will happen to all mankind. There's nothing that is hidden from God. Beware your sins will find you out. And it tells us this. All unrepentant sin unrepented sin there will be a curse for there is a retribution for there is a punishment for because there has to be because the Lord is just but 1 John 4 tells us this perfect love that agape love that selfless gift that God gave to us if we accept it if we accept Christ Jesus as saviour it casts out all fear of that retribution. You've accepted Christ Jesus as Savior and you've had a bad week. You've lied. You've stolen. God won't want me anymore. No. Perfect love casts out the fear of retribution. Not so that you can continue to sin, but though you are repentant and know that you are still falling short of God's glory. The law does not anymore hold sway over you because the mercy of God has been poured out on you. That's why we can't allow another gospel to come into our field. Because it's an important gospel. And many of you, I know, have suffered under terrible affliction of people who have told you, you have crossed a line. There's no place for you in the kingdom of heaven. Lies, every one of them. And those who perpetuate such things are liars and there is no place for them in the kingdom of heaven until they repent of their lies. I was reading yesterday a book of somebody who said, with pastors and counselors like that, who needs demons? God forgave us that we might but of course, if we refuse to still repent of our sins, then we reject Christ as head and we accept our sins back as being Lord over ourselves. Always deal before God with the things that you've done. Always bring them into repentance before him. It's important. But that's who these guys are. You see, the... Prophecy follows on from that. Those of you who accepted Christ Jesus as Savior, that curse, that flying scroll, has no effect on you. But for those who haven't, then it does. And then 
he gets a vision of what it looks like to those people who are within us, but they're not part of us, who are living in that sin and refuse to repent, who would rather live in their own uncleanness than in God's. And it tells us they are wickedness. Unrepentant sin has a cost. And they believe somehow, in the same way that the Pharisees did, that their lineage, who their parents were, because they've gone to church forever, because family went to church forever, because they're morally good, because they're nice to people, because they give to charity, that these good works will save them. And yet, it never saved us. It cannot save us. And although we are saved to do good works, those good works are to serve the Lord, not to serve our own interests. And those who live under such delusions, and they are, None of it will do the service. The only way is by humbling yourself and acknowledging you are a sinner in need of Christ Jesus. That is the most humbling thing to acknowledge. God resists the proud and he exalts the humble. And pride will bring you to destruction. In Zechariah's vision, those who are represented here. It tells us the Lord has put in an ephah, it may say in some of your Bibles, or a basket. The ephah is the largest measure in Israel. It's the largest measure of things. So we can see that God has got a lot of tolerance for this kind of stuff. It's a large measure. He's willing to accept and to take a great deal. But he's put a lead disc upon it. Lead is an unclean metal. It's not a metal that's used in the temple. Therefore, it's not a godly metal. It has no godly reference. But in the time before alloys, it was the heaviest metal that anybody had. So a disc of lead over the top is to mean that that wickedness is secured. And it is secured. When that wickedness is within the church, it is secured. Unless the church itself is as daft as a brush. But there should always be people within the church who are watchmen, who can warn. If you don't listen to that warning, then you're going to get dragged off with them. And that's your choice. The only, only antidote to false teaching is to know your word. Because if you rely on other people to do it for you, how do you know they're not the ones who are trying to carry you off to Shinar? Trust in God. Trust to the word. Search the word. And that's the case. But within the church, that is always revealed. We know what fruits we're looking for. We know that we're looking for the fruits of the Spirit. We know that we're looking for fruits of repentance. You cannot be a secret, Darnell. It's very clear that people are Darnell. It's very obvious to all of you. You know who the Darnells are. You know them in churches and church rounds. You know who the Darnells are. And that security is put with on them. They don't get a chance to move their wickedness in this place. So they move on. She's contained within the church because of her own uncleanness. But when we see the involvement of the spiritual, we see two women who turn up with wings of stalks. And there's a reason that we're told that they've got stalks' wings. We've already kind of established that the women here should not necessarily be here. But storks are an unclean bird in the Levitical line of what is a clean and unclean animal. They are heavy lifting birds, the heaviest lifting birds of all of them. They can carry a considerable weight in storks. And these have got to carry a considerable weight. When we read about Babylon in the book of Revelation, and when Babylon falls, it tells us it was full of unclean birds. And the reference, of course, is to the demonic, to other spiritual powers. They are powered, it tells us, by a spiritual wind, their own power. 
to carry this wickedness and they will carry it away and they will carry its work. It cannot function within the church. So it leaves and it breeds and it builds. And that's the purpose. That's what we see within this whole thing. And because of the great weight of it, it tells us a great number will do that. When the children of Israel walked through the wilderness, there are many times that we saw the few lead the many off. We see Dathan when he causes Aaron to build a false or the golden calf. Many go off and worship the golden calf. We see Korah when he says, Moses and Aaron are no good. Where's our milk and honey? Nobody said you were getting it. Well, we want it. And we've not had it. We want our milk and honey. We could do a better job. And again, the same. Many people fall off with them, listening to their teaching, listening to their arguments, listening to their doctrine, and they leave and they go and they fall short. And they come under the judgment and curse of God. You are safe in the hands of the Lord. And you are at the prey of the wolves when you leave it. In the city of refuge, the man who ran to the city of refuge was safe from the avenger of blood. Could not be found. The avenger of blood could not come into the city and drag him out. He was secured. He was secured by the will of God. But if he left the city, he was fair game. Don't leave the city. Stay within the city. Come into the city. Come into the security of the city of God. Now that's all very interesting. But why is Zechariah telling the Jews who should be rebuilding these things? How at all is any of what I've just said encouraging? You may not feel encouraged at all really to be honest by what I've just said. And there's a reason for it. Well like the Cold War, like the space race, like the race to the North Pole, nothing seems to motivate people than the spirit of competition. The Americans were nowhere with their rocket. Until they found out that the Russians had managed to get one in space, then a whole lot of money got spent. And a whole lot of research went into it so that they could be the first ones to the moon. Today, friends, there's another one who is building. There is another one who is sowing, and that may have passed you by, and you may never have acknowledged that. But Zechariah wanted to let them know that in that spirit of competition which teaches us to hurry up, there is somebody else, except for in this case, the, it isn't that we don't get the prestige of being the first to the moon, because if we let them build and we let them build before us. They're going to keep doing it. But if we let them have free reign without us also having our reign, then it's life and death. It's death for our families. For those people who hear that seed, that gospel, that message, that corruption. Look around at people who have changed. The Mormons that have got their temple in Chorley will tell you that the one group of people they find that they have the best evangelistic outreach with are Christians who are disaffected, lonely. There's not many people in their church. There's not many people their own age in their church. And all of a sudden these young men or young women turn up and they're friendly and they're kind and it doesn't matter and they're brought along and all of a sudden, you're snatched from the city. And you're going off to Shinar. Because it looks better. It feels easier. It's more comfortable. I'd rather do that. This is too hard. But we can't allow the enemy to sow without us being even at the races. Or even being in the game. That is the challenge. The people had stopped building. You had stopped building. And some of you are still living in that ridiculous idea that you were building. You went from 140 people to 30. That's not building. 
You went to two Sunday services and a midweek meeting that was non-existent. That's not building. Please listen to me when I tell you, we have to rebuild. We have to rebuild. We had to rebuild. Because what was gone before was destroyed. It wasn't your fault. You didn't do it. It was done to you. And my heart bleeds for you. I wasn't here. I didn't see it. But I can tell you the truth, that there are people who sit to come through our door and they'd rather chew their own arms off than walk through it because of what went before. There are people who were terrified of this building and the people that were here before for the same reason. You have a reputation throughout the entire region of Lancashire as being a church of difficult people. I am dragged regularly by pastors who say, how is it at Blackburn? It's really hard. And you know, you don't deserve any of it. It's not fair. You aren't those kind of people. And I regularly tell them, no, they're wonderful people. They're really good. What horrible things that have happened to you, that have been said to you, that have been done to you. They are terrible, tragic things. But don't kid yourself that none of it happened. Because it did happen. And we have a choice to build from that. That's what we're doing. We're rebuilding. We'd stopped building and we have to build. We have to build. We have to continue to build. And so we need to know this because if we stop and we say, well, no, we're not interested. Well, don't think the enemy isn't going to keep doing his work. Isn't going to keep sowing his seed. Isn't going to keep building his city. Isn't going to keep building Shinar. And isn't going to keep dragging those people who come along and go, I'm quite interested. Oh, oh. We have to be about it. God is calling us to do his work. And that is the encouragement for us. It's actually a challenge. Inaction causes destruction. Causes people to perish. How can we remain inactive? We can't remain inactive. We have to be bold. Remember this. Babylon persecutes and divides. But the church brings into unity all those who are in fellowship through that gospel. We all came in through the same narrow door. Christ Jesus is our Savior. Therefore, where the Tower of Babel began to undo the works of God, it isn't the EU that are going to undo that. It is God who is going to undo that work. Those tribes, those tongues, those separate places. He's the one who's going to bring us all together, working in our different ways, working in our divergence, working in our individualism, all for one purpose, to build his kingdom. And friends, let's stop trying to build bridges. Let's start trying to build a city. That's what we're here for. Building a city. Building the people of God. Building on one another. Going out and sharing this message of salvation to a world that doesn't want to hear it. But without it, they'll perish. That's our calling as a church. That's who we are. Today we have got so much that is in our favor that God has done and is continuing to do. We look at these blessings every week of all of these things, of how many things that we've overcome in these last four years, long before I even came, you started to overcome and started to battle back. It's my job to encourage you to keep building. So let's keep building because if we don't, well, we're, going, we're not going to lose the race because it's God that sorted the race out. But those whom we wish know Jesus, well, as Einstein says, to keep doing the same thing over and over again and accept different results is insanity. We have to do it because that's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, which challenges us and instructs us. Lord, it teaches us very clear, Lord, that you've called us to build. And Lord, we pray, Lord, uh, we know that there is an enemy out there that's building as well that is wickedness, Lord. And that that enemy can come from within. 
and comes out that we will never give it a foothold here, Lord. But that, Lord, that we always know that we must continue to sow the seed and continue to preach a gospel. Lord, forgive us for our inaction. Build within us. In your mighty name, Father. Amen.